The libertarian economist Walter Williams was born in 1936 in a poor but thriving section of Philadelphia that was later torn apart by crime and violence. This is where we lived, the Richard Allen Project of North Philadelphia. When Williams was a small child, his father deserted his family. He was raised by his mother, who was a high school dropout, and the family spent time on welfare. I broke out of the North Philadelphia ghetto nearly 30 years ago, and so did most of my friends. Drafted into the peacetime army, Williams eventually earned a Ph.D. from UCLA in the late 1960s, and he soon became a sought-after researcher and public intellectual. His best-known book, 1982's The State Against Blacks, argues that a major cause of black unemployment is government intervention in the labor market. It is morally outrageous for government to be cutting off the ambitions of those trying to climb the middle rungs of the economic ladder. You're saying that you can solve the problems in Bangladesh. Williams' contrarian views have had wide exposure through documentaries, public appearances, and for the past 30 years, a syndicated weekly column that appears in about 140 newspapers. Throughout his career, Williams has used his personal experiences to illustrate his ideas. I used to work in a store like this. Back in those days, just about any kid who looked for a job could find one. Today, in ghettos like I grew up in, 70% of black children who look for jobs cannot find them. His new book, Up From the Projects, an autobiography, is a fascinating look at his childhood, his half-century-long marriage to his recently departed wife, his unusual career path, and the genesis of his views on race, economics, and politics. Reason TV spoke with Williams, an emeritus trustee of the Reason Foundation, at his office at Virginia's George Mason University. Walter, thanks for talking to us. Thank you. You were growing up uh, in Philadelphia. You spent time on welfare. You were raised in a single-parent household. How does where you're from show up in where you are now? Well, I, I'm not sure. I, uh, you know, as a, as a youngster, I never even thought about being a college professor or, or a libertarian. I was always a, uh, a radical, a troublemaker, a person who questioned the, uh, the status quo. Uh, so the, my upbringing might have had uh, very little to do with uh, uh, where I am now. And matter of fact, even though we grew up poor, we didn't, we didn't consider ourselves poor. That is, matter of fact, during those days to call somebody poor was an insult. Or even to what, what did being called poor mean then? Well, it, it meant that, well, you didn't eat, or you, uh, you, you uh, missed meals, or you wore uh, tattered clothes, and, uh, and all those weren't the case uh, with me. But uh, at least in the neighborhoods where I grew up, in uh, poor black neighborhoods uh, today, there's kind of a, what I call spiritual poverty, that is poverty of the spirit. And uh, back when I was a kid, uh, my mother used to always say to us, she says, you know, we have a beer pocketbook, but we have champagne taste. Uh, meaning that we uh, had high aspirations. So where does the spiritual poverty or where does the aspirational poverty come from? Well, if, if, you, if you look at some of the characteristics, particularly of black people, but it applies to a large extent to everybody, uh, back when I was coming up, uh, that is for a girl to have a, uh, a baby out of wedlock, it was a disgrace. Today, uh, women have babies out of wedlock and they have uh, baby showers. It's no, it's no longer a disgrace. And indeed, the uh, illegitimacy rate among blacks is somewhere around 70 percent and back in the 40s it couldn't have been more than 13, uh, 12 percent, something like that. Or the, the breakdown in the black family, only 35 percent of kids, uh, black kids live in two-parent two families. And matter of fact, when we were coming up, my, my father deserted us when I was three and my sister was two and my, they ultimately got divorced in, night, in the late uh, uh, 40s. But, uh, but among, our ki among our friends, we were the only kids in the Richard Allen Housing Project that did not have a mother and father in the house. And, uh, and today would be exactly the opposite. It would be rare to have a mother and father in the, uh, in the household today. In 2008, you wrote that uh, Obama's election, and I'm quoting here, might turn our attention away from the false notion that discrimination explains the problems of a large segment of the black community. Mm -hmm. uh, has that happened? I don't think uh, Obama's presidency didn't hasn't meant very much for the black community. I don't see any big change. I don't see lower crime rates. I don't see a more greater high school uh, graduation uh, rates. Uh, uh, and and but in general, I, I don't think that uh, there is much uh, a progress that blacks can make through the political arena. And uh, now what do you mean by that? Because this is. 
You know, I, I think most uh, people, most observers, whether they're black or white or uh, you know European, whatever, would say that you know that a lot of black progress has be been because of civil rights act, because of changes in de jure if segregation. You look, if you ask the question, uh, you look at our country and you ask the question: <clears throat> In what cities do blacks have the uh, highest crime suffer from the highest victimize, victimization rates from crime? The, the, the rottenest schools, the, the very, very poor living conditions, they are in the very cities where a black is the mayor, a black is chief of the police, a black is, is the superintendent of the schools. Now, I'm not stating a causal relationship, but I'm saying that if political power meant so much, you would expect, let's say, in a city like Philadelphia, where a black is the mayor, a black is superintendent of school, black chief of police, you'd expect every living conditions to be wonderful. And, but, and on the other hand, if you look at the other end of a, other, another group of people, let's say Chinese and Japanese, they don't have any political power, even in the places such on the West Coast where they're the most I'm numerous. I'm not even sure the Chinese have much political power in China. Uh, that's yeah. <laughs> well, at least in, in, yeah. in the United States. Right. Yeah. But however, according to uh, uh, statistics, uh, Japanese or Chinese are in, in, on any measure of socioeconomic success. They're at the very top. And, and matter of fact, if you look in our history of our country, uh, the Irish uh, had the greatest political power, and, but they're the slowest rising of any of the white ethnics, right. ethnic groups in our country. So I think it's false to assume that that economic power depends on political power. And so, you can just go all around the world. My colleague yeah. Tom Sowell has done the, uh, extensive work on you know, the Armenians in the post-Ottoman Empire. They didn't have any political power. They were discriminated against, but the highest income earning people. Yeah, Jews as well throughout various subsets. Yeah, the Chinese uh, and Southeast Chinese, Asia. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not political power that will help advance uh, living standards and quality of life, how do, how do you, uh, I mean, it's economic power then, right? You have to develop skills and training. And one of the reasons why people make low wages is for the most part they have low skills. But, but, but uh, getting, again, getting hold of the political system or, or even eliminating every vestige of discrimination is not very important for economic uh, advancement. I mean, if you look at the question, at one time there were no blacks in the, in the, in the uh, professional basketball. Today, blacks are 80% 80, 80 of uh, professional uh, basketball players, 60-some percent of professional football players, and it wasn't any affirmative, affirmative action, it wasn't any court suits, it wasn't getting rid of discrimination. What was it? It was that these guys can just do a 360 slam dunk in your face and you can't do anything about it. It was but just it, high skills. But it was an undoing of discrimination, right? I mean, when, when you think about uh, uh, football and basketball's color lines are less uh, kind of celebrated than Jackie mm -hmm. Robinson breaking into Major League Baseball, but there was a de facto law against uh, letting blacks play. Well, the best engines of it, it, it even in terms of in terms of baseball, it wasn't any affirmative action. It wasn't any court suits. It was the fact that there was a huge ta a huge pool of of a uh, high skills in the Negro, what they call the Negro leagues, that just could not be ignored. And once uh, uh, the Dodgers cracked it. Everybody else had to go along. They just could not ignore this huge p uh, pool of black talent. Well, you would agree. And, and it would be yeah. the same thing if this black talent were in physics, were in right. chemistry. You just could not ignore it. What are the best ways to speed up the process by which race or ethnicity or social standing doesn't matter in fields that should be determined by merit? Mm, well, if, yeah, if it's not laws. Well, well, per well, personally, one of my strong values is freedom of association. And when, if you believe in freedom of association, you have to accept that people will associate in ways that you find offensive. And I believe people have the right to discriminate on any basis they want so long as they're not using uh, 
uh, a government so long as they're not using, you know, for example, I would disagree that a library would, uh, should be able to engage in racial discrimination against me because right. I'm a taxpayer. So a I'm public support. library, but yeah. a private library, private library the, the no, David I'm, Duke Memorial Library, they can keep I you no, out. I have no problem yeah. whatsoever. And, and see, discrimination is, 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 is actually, for me, discrimination is just simply an act of choice. And, and we all discriminate when, when, as I tell people, that when I was choosing a wife to marry, I didn't give every woman an equal opportunity. I discriminated against Japanese women, uh, Italian women, women with criminal records, women that did not re bathe regularly. I discriminated in all Did you also, ways. you discriminated against women who uh, refused to return your phone calls, I assume? Well, we didn't have a telephone, <laughs> but, 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 the, but, the, no, but the point is, is that that people have the right, in my opinion, to associate in any ways they want. But, however, they should not get subsidized. Now, there's a whole lot of laws on, on the books that subsidizes discrimination. It, for example, the minimum wage law mm -hmm. that subsidizes uh, engaging in but racial then discrimination. In, in the book, you also talk about when you were drafted into the Army and you ended up going to Georgia for an assignment. That was the first time that you met up with a de jure segregation in, in the Deep South. and. Uh, you mentioned going through bus stations and whatnot where there were, you know, colored only uh, restrooms, black only mm -hmm. restrooms, restaurants, mm -hmm. etc. What is the best and most efficacious way to break down state-sponsored discrimination? Well, you, d you do it by the law because I, I, I think that states, do, uh, states should not be able to dis uh, uh, engage in discrimination. And you, you do it by any means, any means that's necessary. Mm -hmm and to get rid of uh, state-sponsored discrimination, and including just disobeying the law. And I think that one of the things, the, the very fact that you do find state-sponsored discrimination is good evidence that, that maybe discrimination would not exist. That is, if you see a law on the books, well, the reason why that law is on the books is because not everyone would behave according to specifications of the law. And so if you say, well, if you see a law saying, well, blacks have to be, uh, uh, have to sit in the back of the trolley car, well, you say, well, why do you need a law? If, if the pro trolley cars are privately owned, that's what they were when the discrimination started in our country, well, the, and uh, private car, uh, streetcar companies would not discriminate against the customers, so the people who wanted discrimination uh, needed a law. So where does that bring you in terms of uh, a variety of the Civil Rights Acts that were passed in the late 50s through the mid-60s? Were those good laws? Were the Civil Rights Acts good and necessary ways of breaking down No, no, I, th I think the Civil Rights Act was a major error. That is, during the 1960s, when we had the Civil Rights Movement, I think all that we needed was the, uh, a law that said that the Constitution of the United States applies to each and every citizen in our country, right. as opposed to making a Civil Rights Act, as, you know, as they in fact did. You, know. you mentioned in the book that uh, both when you were hired as an economist at Temple and then again at George Mason, that you sat down with your, uh, the people who were hiring you and said, hey, if you're practicing affirmative action, I don't want any part of this. Mm -hmm. Um, what, were you a beneficiary of affirmative action, and if so, uh, you know, how did you deal with that when you found out about it, and what, were, what was the effect of that on you? Well, I, I, um, I understand at, at Temple University I did not run into the problem, but at George Mason University, I think uh, after I'd been here quite a while, the, and the, uh, the former chairman who hired me, he said that he got, good, he got, he got beneficial points right. from hiring me and, uh, and, and Karen Vaughn, my colleague who's a, uh, who's a woman. Right. And, um, and and later on, Karen Vaughn, who was here before I was, uh, she told me that uh, that if if uh, Bill Snavely, Bill Snavely was pr practicing uh, affirmative action, they weren't. He w he didn't get the right kind of black. Is it tiresome to talk about yourself as the libertarian black? Yeah. You know, well, I, well, I I look at people. Uh, I don't see colors. Uh, I I don't judge people by colors. Uh, I say that well, gee, you're 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 a man just like I am, and um, and and whatever whatever you are after that, that's what my uh, stepfather used to say. He says every man stands up to piss, and he's whatever he is after that. Do colleges still practice affirmative action uh, for racial admissions, and should that stop? Well, I think I think it definitely should stop, and and and, and, and most college. Oh yes, yeah. most colleges do. Increasingly, there are reports that affirmative action is being practiced to bring men into campuses because women tend to do better on SATs. Is that equally bad? Well, I, I think that if if it is a private university, 
private universities would have the right to do, in my opinion, they have the right to do anything they want in terms of, uh, of, of uh, admitting students. Public universities, I think they ought to be constrained by the law that they just cannot engage in any kind of a... a what about private schools that are so heavily subsidized either by federal research dollars, student loans? <laughs> well, I mean, then, then, are, then they yeah. are in effect the government schools. Right, right. Uh, the, uh, and so, and, and if they're heavily subsidized, and which I, first thing I would do, I'd get rid of the subsidizing and then let right. them behave any way they want to. In the book, you said that uh, people like Jackie Robinson and Will Chamberlain had made it safe for the NBA and Major League Baseball to hire incompetent blacks such as you so that you could now pursue a career in baseball or uh, basketball. Do well, you what, think what, what, I, what I meant by that example, I was telling a group of students, and it was indeed at Temple University, and I was saying that uh, I would love to teach a course in physics. I love uh, subatomic uh, physics, but I was saying that black people cannot afford for me to be teaching a course in, uh, in physics. And I was saying that I was giving an example of basketball that, uh, and baseball because of the excellence that, uh, of, of Jackie Robinson or Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell, that I can now go play basketball and I can mess up royally and there's not a person in the audience can say those blacks can't play blas basketball. That is, in that sense, I meant that black that uh, black people can afford incompetent basketball players, but they cannot afford afford incompetent physics teachers. Now, do you think? And that's that and the same thing applies to. Uh, I wrote a column about uh, about uh, Obama. That is, uh, uh, black people. I said I don't think that they can afford for the first black president to be a failure, and he has every indication of being a, a failure like the Carter administration. Well, but do you think, uh, I guess that's the broader point, is that uh, between 1954 and now, race relations have clearly changed, mm -hmm. and most of the most odious, obvious excrescences of racism mm -hmm. are gone. Are we past race, or will we ever be past We're race? We're not past it yet. Yeah. That is, uh, um, uh, you, you know, I, I think we've come, uh, you know, Americans have come the furthest distance uh, among any group of people in solving uh, uh, the problems of race in our country, but we're not past it. That is, you know, for example, I was, I was saying in the book that I teach, our, our, uh, I teach PhD microeconomic theory, and at Temple University, I hadn't detected it at George Mason University, but at Temple University, I, the white students who are most of the students in the PhD program, uh, at the beginning of the semester, they're asking me hard questions, things like this. They're, they were really testing my credentials. Right. And so they, you know, check and see, well, how was affirmative action higher, you know? And then after they, uh, after I just calmly answered their questions, uh, they said, well, they better learn some economics. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so that in, in, in the sense that, uh, in, in that sense, in terms of pride of a people, I think that black people just cannot afford incompetence in, in many, in most areas. Right, still. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, your experience in the academy. You went to UCLA in the, in the mid to late 60s. Uh, you uh, worked with people like James Buchanan and Armin Alshian. What was it like to be at, at a place like UCLA then? This was a hotbed, not simply of, you know, I mean, it was the American dream to be in California in the 60s, yeah. but also from a libertarian point of view, this was a powerhouse department for free market mm -hmm. ideas. Yeah. Well, I, uh, uh, as I said in the book, I, I did not know that I was <laughs> anything about UCLA when I, uh, when I entered there, and I didn't know that it was one of the top 10 economics departments in the country, and I was in well over my head. Uh, and there, and, and the, these are some of the top professors in the economics in the world, and uh, and and I benefited immensely from uh, going to uh, uh, attending UCLA. But however, it was quite a challenge for me. How um, much did that form your ideology or your, um, you know, kind of political thought? Well, I, I think it awakened me in something that always been. I've always been a radical. I've always challenged the status quo. And, but however, I did come out, you know, I, I supported things like minimum wage laws because I thought it was a, a good idea until I ran some professors and say, well, look, Walter, uh, uh, let's look at the effects of the minimum wage law as opposed to looking at the intention. They gave me material to read and, and, I, and then I changed my mind. But I, I think that my free market ideas uh, got polished at UCLA and being exposed to 
uh, some of the greatest economists in, in the world. Do you think that you benefited from having a kind of roundabout route to studying economics as opposed to you know being a whiz kid and you know graduating high school when you're 13 and then going directly mm -hmm. to college and a PhD? If I had gone to college right after high school it would have been an unmitigated disaster. I was <laughs> for the, immature. the country as well as the if, uh, as well as you. At least for me I was just unprepared uh, to mm -hmm. make kind of make the uh, the sacrifices necessary. And I think many times that's uh, that's true with uh, uh, many people today. That is, uh, I'm very sure, if I had to do it again, I tell my wife that it went with my daughter. Uh, she, she went out, she was 17 years old and she went right into college and first year or so was a disaster. Mm -hmm. And I said if we had to do it again, I would would have gotten her a job at McDonald's or at a car wash for a couple of days to let, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years to let some maturity set in. So maybe gaining some maturity, uh, you know, by a year or two uh, outside of uh, uh, education and then go to college. And then, but more importantly, pay your own way. Would you have been able to go to college? I mean, you mentioned uh, quite often that how heavily subsidized, and particularly in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. I mean, the UC system, Cal State system, very subsidized, effectively a free education. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a good thing, though, even if it's coming from the state and even if it's being expropriated from taxpayers? No, it's not a good thing. No, it's not a good thing. Would, would, benefited... would you have been able to go to college otherwise? Uh, I might not have, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of the incentive for uh, my wife and I to move from Philadelphia to Los Angeles in 1961 was that I, no way in the world I could afford to go to Temple University. Temple University was the cheapest school in the city, and I think it was like $2,000 a, a, a year to go there. And I went to Cal State LA, and it was $125 right. uh, a, a year, I believe it was a, a year there. And so I got a highly, subject, uh, uh, highly subsidized education. And I don't know whether I would have gotten an education, but still, that be because I got an education, it doesn't mean that it was a good idea to rip off the California taxpayers. Well, do you think in a cost-benefit analysis, if you take yourself and everybody else who went through Cal State and the costs associated with that, mm -hmm. And then the payback, because you certainly have paid a lot more back in taxes mm -hmm. than the, you know, uh, what would it be, about uh, 400 bucks, 500 bucks mm -hmm. for four years of Cal State at 125. Not you know, to the California taxpayers. Okay, all right. Because when, yeah. when I finished ripping them off, I left. <laughs> But however, but I mean, but is that, I mean, is it a fair question from a libertarian point of view? We all want to say, you know what? Every, nothing should be taken from the taxpayer except mm -hmm. very small uh, pots of money that go to clear public goods, and education doesn't meet that test. Yeah. So, but you know, then again, like you know, we're sitting, you're working at George Mason, you worked at Temple. These are state universities. Uh, you know, is is it such a bad thing? That well, we well, if yeah. You know, I could have just as soon uh, gone to Cal State uh, or, or UCLA, and they and they charge a, a tuition of five thousand a year, five thousand dollars a year, and I could have gone out and robbed somebody and got the five thousand dollars. So you wouldn't like make the argument that well, gee, you know, Williams robbed the guy to right. get five thousand dollars, and he's going to pay it back and and uh, you know uh, later on in life, you know, by higher taxes or whatever. But the solution to the problem is that we need to do something with the uh, with the financial markets mm -hmm. to enable people to be get, be able to get a loan mm -hmm. to be able to go to college and then of course pay it back. George Mason has become a very well-known hotbed of libertarian laissez-faire economic history from a free market perspective from a libertarian mm -hmm. perspective. How did that happen? How did you go from helping to build George Mason's academic reputation from kind of so-so to really moving it up a few notches? Well, I, I think um, all, all the responsibility is not mine. I, I, I share with my, uh, my colleagues. But I became a chairman in 1995, no. and I was chairman from 1995 until uh, 2001. When Buchanan won the Nobel Prize right. in 1986, uh, we had 26 faculty members. And when I became chairman, we had 18. Mm -hmm. There was considerable hostility towards our department, and I tried to, you know, to work with the administration to uh, rehire those people, and I had a lot of difficulty. And so I just said, well, the only way I'm going to improve the department is to try to privatize the department, mm -hmm. and actually go out and raise money uh, to uh, to be able to do things with the fact to be able to make hire, you know, to hire people mm -hmm. and to subsidize hiring people. And so a lot of it was. 
with the generosity of, uh, of supporters uh, out there, uh, uh, the uh, Lilly Endowment and, and the, the Olin uh, Foundation. And the Olin Foundation. Now, this is, I mean, so you brought in a, a new revenue stream. Oh, yeah, I brought in a lot, a lot yeah. of money. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people in the academy and from outside say, okay, this is a kind of corporate takeover of the university and of the academy. And it that, wasn't uh, a corporate takeover. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, talk about that. How did you secure academic freedom for your uh, research faculty? Well, yeah, I think that the the people who who gave me money and a lot of it was just uh, you know, private uh, um, donations. The people who gave me money, they they just they they respected me and my ambitions and my vision, and the, and, and I had complete uh, say so over how the money would be uh, spent, and so they and that made, explains they, the gold fixtures in the men's room here <laughs> on the uh, economics they, building. But. No, I wish I did, but. But uh, they, had, they had no say-so in how the money would be spent. And then also towards the end of my uh, uh, tenure as uh, chairman, uh, the, my, uh, my colleagues, uh, they actually they were very successful in raising money, uh, were able to uh, uh, hire Vernon Smith right. and, uh, and, matter of fact, his crew from uh, uh, Arizona right. and uh, bring all six or seven, seven, I think, here. And he was here for a year and a half, and he uh, won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, you guys timed that uh, perfectly, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah. let's uh, talk a bit about the uh, broad-based libertarian movement. Um, do you do you feel that you're part of a libertarian movement? No, and, I don't. No. So uh, what are you then? Well, I'm I'm not a part of a movement. I've never been a part of a movement. I just. Uh, 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 I just do my own thing. Can we tally up a score and say, are we more free, are we less free, are we moving in the right direction? Are you happy about the world that your daughter is inheriting and that your no, no, grandchildren I, I, no. like? I think for the first time, first time in our history, it's prudent for parents to uh, tell their children to have enough gold and silver coins, to, enough to be able to get out of this country and, and, and move to some, uh, move somewhere to else. Move to Canada? Well, somewhere else. Yeah. You know. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, for example, Jews in Austria, I mean, they should have had enough money to get out and it didn't make any difference where they moved. Right. You know, so the point is, is that for the first time in our history, a people are considering leaving the United States or taking their wealth out of the United States where all before the United States was the bastion of liberty and, uh, and, and low regulation, and people are bringing their wealth to our country. So I think that we have to uh, uh, be concerned what about needs, losing our liberties. What needs to happen for that to reverse? Uh, I mean, and it's one thing to say, okay, we've got to reduce regulation, but what are, what are the kind of policy steps and the, the kind of psychological or ideological steps that need to happen? I don't think, I don't think anything's going to happen. I think, what, I think what one has to ask himself is, uh, are, are we so arrogant as American people to think that we are different from other people around the world? That is, do we, or how different are we from the Romans who went down the tubes, or the British, or the French, or the, or the Spanish, or the Portuguese? These are, uh, these are great empires of the past, but they went down the tubes for roughly the same things that we're doing. Liberty is the rare state of affairs in mankind's history. Arbitrary abuse and control by others is the standard dish, even now. And all the tendencies are, is for us to lose, uh, have greater and greater amounts of our liberty uh, usurped by uh, government. If you press me for a trend in the opposite direction, because of the, the Obama administration, the Democrat control of the House and the Senate, they become they become so bold in many of their actions that for the first time in my life, Americans are debating about the Constitution with people forming a Tea Party movement and, and all this kind of fervor that I've never heard before in my 75 years of life. But is that enough or is it too late? And I'm not sure. Walter Williams, thank you very much for talking with us and for all of your writing and especially your new book, Up From the Projects and Autobiography. Okay.